us pray. O God, the strength of all who hope in you, because we are weak mortals, we accomplish nothing good without you. Help us to see and understand the things we ought to do and give us the grace and power to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. First reading comes from Deuteronomy. Moses said to the people, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Please read Psalm 119 responsibly. Happier are they whose way is blameless, who follow the teaching of the Lord. Who never do any wrong, but always walk in your ways. Oh, that my ways were made so direct that I might keep your statutes. I will thank you with a true heart when I have learned your righteous judgments. The second reading comes from 1 Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now, you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together, you are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. 
But, if, but I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I invite the kids to come up front with me. Thanks for coming up. So today, um, this afternoon and evening, what's going on? The Super Bowl, the Super Bowl right? That's consuming a lot of people's attention. And who, who are we rooting for? The Eagles, right? Fly, bird, fly, Eagles, fly, go birds, all that. People get pretty into, even though your mom is not particularly into it, people get pretty into who they're supporting, right? They, some people go all out. We've seen cars that people like redecorated for uh, whoever they're supporting, right? At school, Paul, you, you and your band went around and played the Eagles fight song since their uh, band teacher is a big fan. Mm -hmm. And other people were put stuff on their door if they supported the other team, right? When it comes to our sports teams, we get pretty into saying, I support these people, I support those people, right? We take sides. And when we want our team to win, what does that mean we want for the other team? Lose. We want them to lose, right? We don't want everybody to just have a good time, right? We get very competitive. Well, in the reading that we had from uh, 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul saw something like that happening in the church and it wasn't about sports teams or anything like that it was divisions within the church about people taking sides about who they supported what leaders they were behind whether it was paul or whether it was apollos in other places he names others too and it was causing divisions in the church because just like when we think about sports teams if we want our team to be recognized as the best that means other people are not as good not good enough, right? And so he saw these divisions really tearing people apart. And he says that's not the way it is in the church, right? And he says, it's, think about it less like a, a competition and more like a garden. And he has this image where he says, you know, there's lots of things to do in the garden, right? Lots of jobs. Like, what can you think of that there is in, in, the, in a garden?
Right. Oh, Weed, pulling yeah. weeds, right? So there's the planting, the watering, the waiting, the weeding, the harvesting. And all of that might be done by different people, but we're all working towards the same goal. And he says, God is the one who makes everything grow. We do our little part, but God is the one who makes everyone grow. And we are all together on God's team. And the sun, right, the sun participates helping the plants grow. Yeah. So even though we can enjoy our sports games and it's okay to root for one team and not the other, when we're talking about our life together in the Christian community, we need to watch out for those times when we find ourselves taking sides against other members of the church community, whether it's our congregation or the whole big church on earth, to know that we are all just doing our own little bit and God is the one who makes it all grow. Let's pray. God, thank you for giving us your son around whom we gather to be all together in one team, one family. Water and, and uh, nurture the works that we do that there may be growth in your church and life in your world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, thanks. Let's go Eagles, right? <laughs> Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, Trinity of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, in case you didn't know it, Valentine's Day is right around the corner. Tuesday, in fact. Of course, if you've been in any kind of store lately, there's no doubt that you already know that. It is the usual hearts, candy, and flower explosion right now. In the U.S., we spend vast amounts of money on Valentine's Day. This year, consumers are expected to spend around $26 billion on all of the jewelry and evenings out and candy and cards and flowers and all the rest of it. And that works out to close to an average of $193 per person. And it's not just the costs that are high. Expectations can soar, too. For many folks, there's a lot of pressure to get these grand expressions of love and devotion just right. And anxiety about not meeting expectations. But for anyone who's been in a relationship of any kind, not just a romantic relationship, we know that in actuality what matters most in the health of that relationship is not the grand gestures at all. Love and commitment are not revealed in the big speeches and heartfelt gifts alone, or even primarily. It's the day-to-day -day choices we make, including when the flowers have wilted and the candy is long gone, that build and reveal true love and faithfulness. The same is true for our relationship with God and God's people. In our first reading the book of De from the book of Deuteronomy, Moses has been making a long speech to the people of Israel. They are about to cross into the promised land without him. And before they do, he reviews for them what they've learned and been given from God in their 40 years of wilderness wandering. He reminds them of the commandments God has given them and of the shape of life God has laid out for them to live as God's covenant people. Today, we hear the dramatic ending. I set before you a choice, Moses says, between life and blessings on the one hand and death and curses on the other. Choose God and God's ways, he implores them. Choose life. Now, no one hearing those choices set before them is going to say, mm, I'll choose door two. Death and curses for me, please. We hear this exhortation to cement our relationship with God by making the right choice. And we say, yes, we desire blessings. We choose life. We are lining up on God's side. We'll do everything you say. But no matter how heartfelt the promise, life with God is not all about this grand gesture, the stirring words and 
festivals to commemorate them. Love and commitment are built and shown in the many choices we make day by day. We have to choose life again and again. It's about choosing daily patterns of intimacy with God, showing up in prayer, in study of scriptures, in worship, individually and with the gathered community. And it's about all the ways we live out our faith in our ordinary, everyday lives. This kind of faithfulness will go far beyond checking off a list of commandments kept. Scripture shows us again and again that it is living from the spirit of the law, God's intentions for flourishing life that the law is meant to give some structure to, that matters most. Choose life can't be heard as always follow your bliss on the one hand or never step out of line on the other. It's not just about our personal happiness or morality or holiness. Choosing life is choosing what supports life for the community, including neighbors, strangers, and even enemies. Jesus' admonitions in the gospel reading today fit within this mindset. He's expanding on what he said last week about having a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. He starts off with the commandment not to murder. And for most of us, that feels like the easiest commandment to keep, right? But Jesus takes it deeper. The spirit of the law, choosing life in this instance, isn't just about the daily choice to not literally kill someone, he says. It's also about the daily choices and attitudes that pave the way for murder and the daily choices and attitudes that create an environment aligned with the ways of death and not flourishing life. It's not that we'll never feel anger. To imagine that that is the bar is unrealistic as long as we inhabit these mortal bodies. And anger serves a purpose, alerting us that something is wrong or unjust. The question is, what will we choose to do with the anger? Will we nurse it and feed it and harbor grudges? Will we let it lead us to contempt for others or to broken relationships? Author Karen Walrand has a helpful image. She says that anger can be a useful spark, but it's a terrible fuel. We, feel, we will feel anger, for better or worse. But what choices will we make in how we use and diffuse it that will be choices in service of life? for ourselves and our communities. Jesus then moves on to address adultery in a similar way. It's not only the choice not to betray your spouse in that end of the line way. It's the daily choices of honoring our promises. Desire and attraction will arise unbidden like anger. Choosing life comes in whether we let our mind and heart linger there and whether we act on it. When Jesus speaks about divorce, he again takes us beyond the strict letter of the law, which said that a man could divorce his wife without cause, with no provision for her well-being, in, in a society where that would have made her incredibly vulnerable. It was a different world where a woman had little agency and almost no ability to be self-sufficient. Jesus urges us to make choices that honor God's intentions for marriage to be a community that supports life. When he addresses oaths, he calls us to be people of such integrity where our words regularly match our actions that we won't need to swear by anything else. Our word alone will stand. And in the next section after today's reading ends, Jesus goes on to talk about retaliation, moving us beyond an eye for an eye, to forgiveness and generosity and love even for our enemies. In all these areas, Jesus calls us into the complicated daily work of choosing life in God's kingdom, life for ourselves and our communities in the big ways and the small ones, beyond the minimum required for checking off boxes and into the fullness of life that is abundant 
for all. One of the quotes that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is famous for is, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. God is the one bringing about the new creation, not us. The kingdom of God that broke into this world in Jesus Christ will be fully revealed. We, with our acts of selfishness, cruelty, and hypocrisy, can't ultimately defeat what God wills and has put into motion. It is good news indeed that it does not depend on us. But there are so many daily choices that go into us being able to be a part of that bent towards justice in life rather than working against it. And it's complex. It's not as always as simple as do not murder, though of course that's part of it. Choosing life plays out in simple daily interactions and in broad societal policies and laws. If we desire to choose life, to foster life, to be part of the universe bending towards justice, what does that mean for how we engage with topics from policing to housing to education? Stakes are high, the Bible seems to be telling us. How do we get it right? The way Moses and Jesus present their admonitions and teachings here can admittedly be hard for us to hear. Choose life from beginning to end or scary bad things will happen. But to some degree, that represents the worldview of the time. And it's also a literary device designed to heighten our response. There's no evidence that in the early Christian community, people went around gouging out their eyes and cutting off their hands. They understood what Jesus was saying here to be hyperbole, a deliberate exaggeration to make a point. It's like a giant sign saying, pay attention, this is important. But it's also, to some degree, stating a simple truth, one that we all experience. There are real-world consequences to the choices that pay lip service to choosing life in God's name while our daily actions don't match. That's a path that takes us as individuals and communities further and further away from the abundant life that our hearts desire because God desires it for us. There's a cost to not choosing life. Now, if you're like me, hearing all of this leaves you feeling kind of a mix of two ways. There's desire and renewed commitment to be part of all of this yet underlying it a sense of resignation and defeat. We know ourselves too well. Resolving to do better is not a magic wand that will transform us. Choose life, God says, and we want to, we mean to, we say that we will with hearts and flowers, but again and again, we choose the ways that lead to death instead. In Romans 7, verses 21 to 25, the Apostle Paul names this reality and the hope that God has brought into it. So I find it to be a law, he writes, that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who will rescue us from the reality that we find ourselves unable to choose the life God sets before us, the life we desire? Jesus rescues us. In him, God chooses life for us. Because it turns out we cannot just choose it for ourselves. We fumble our way towards faithfulness. But God's faithfulness is unshakable. God chooses us in Christ, in our baptism and again every day, and works life in us. Seeking life, we turn to the cross, receiving the forgiveness and life God gives freely there 
then with that life already within us, we can turn toward our neighbors, ready to work for their well-being, not for the sake of securing our blessings, but because we've already been blessed. There is nothing left for us to earn, but everything left for us to share. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, he tells us. And he has chosen you. No candy and flowers, but all the love of God's heart poured out for you. May our choices make that love known, that the world will know this abundant life. Amen. be seated. With the whole church, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Inspire your church that it may be a sign of life throughout the world, from the exploration of faith with children and new believers to missionaries and bishops. Shape lives of faithfulness so that all find abundant life in your ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Nourish your creation. Accompany all who plant and water. Bless the work of farmers. Provide for subsistence farming, face, farm, where farmers face drought and climate change. Guide the work of agricultural scientists towards sustainable ways to feed the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give growth where there seems to be no hope for life. In nations and regions where reconciliation seems impossible, empower peacemakers with your spirit. Where death holds sway through violence, disease, and hunger, equip relief workers to bring hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Nurture all in need. Be with those who are troubled, ill, or grieving, including Janet Hansen, Doug Gable, Foy Stamball, Verla Gosnell, Sherry Fieser, John Smith, Lavera and Evelyn Resch, Gloria Krebs, Caleb Tronk, Nancy and Jerry Fry Markle, Ron Schwartz, Bob Markle, Samantha Zorball, Herb Smith, Tamara Lease, Penny Sedora, Gwen Shinetska, Louis Redding, Sharon Kirchner, Angie Zepp, Melissa Hipkiss, Joanne Forey, Brock Beckham, Troy Ginder, Shane Smith, Erica Smith, Stephanie Burkheimer, Kirsten Thomas, Kathy Seifert, Steve, Wes Klonk, the family and friends of Shirley Niederer. In illness and sadness, there is also joy. Let us rejoice for the birth of Ella Spencil and parents Mason and Melanie. Bring healing to all who experience trauma caused by systems of injustice and destructive relationships. Give courage to those struggling to repent and those seeking reconciliation. Sustain all who work for restoration. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Encourage this congregation. Call us to a common purpose. Turn our hearts toward you and guide our leaders so that our choices may be life-giving for all. Be with those who help shape our lives of faithfulness. Bishop Dunlop, Pastor Sigrid, our faith partners and missionaries, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thanks be to you for the lives of all who have died in Christ. Teach us to follow them in your ways and gather us with them into the promise of eternal life with you. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We bring you to our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. Please stand. The peace of Christ be with you always. I'm also with you. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with those around you.
Let us pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings and thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus our Savior. Amen. Before we begin the communion liturgy, I just want to acknowledge that um, some of you have noticed um, when our sister Edna was struggling a little bit, they've called the ambulance, so they may be arriving here. Um, she's responding. Um, so I just want to offer a word of prayer before we continue. Gracious God, you who are our healer, we pray for Edna. Lift her up to you, Lord, that you lay your hand of healing upon her. Give her strength and courage um, and just help us all in this time as we care for her. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is Christ's table, and he is the host of this meal. So come, you who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often, and you who have not been for a while. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed. Come, Christ promises to meet us here. You may be seated. As we come forward for communion, um, I think we'll all just go this direction. Um, we may just only even need one communion, one wine pourer at this point, so that we just have everybody funnel this way for now.
body of Christ given for you. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Please stand. <laughs> the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, love kindness, and journey humbly with you. Amen. If you ordered subs and sandwiches and didn't pick them up yesterday, they're available this morning down in the kitchen in the cooler. You can also purchase homemade soups there. They are $6 a jar, and they have chicken corn, vegetable beef, and ham and bean. There's a basket where you can put the money, or Linda, will you be down there as well? Okay. Um, and the money from the soup will be added to the $351 that was raised from the sub and sandwich sale. So all of that goes to Harvest of Hope. Thank you for the ways you support that ministry. Um, if you are interested in participating in our Lenten um, Adult Sunday School, Making Sense of Scripture, um, please do sign up today uh, on the sheet in the narthex or by emailing me. I want to make sure there's enough folks interested in doing it um, to know whether we're going to continue. And our Ash Wednesday service is coming up soon on February 22nd at 7 p.m., so just make sure you have that on your calendars. Are there other announcements today? Yes. Marty's birthday. Marty. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Should we sing? daughter has that on video so <laughs> any other announcements today and we will of course continue to keep Edna in our prayers and I'll let you know if I hear anything the God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod bless strengthen and uphold you today and always amen
in peace, follow in the way of Jesus. Thanks be to God.